If I don't want to be a veterinarian when I grow up, because I might change it to an actress, but I mostly want to be a veterinarian. I'll be a cop, a fireman, a, a, a lawyer. A lawyer. A math teacher and a German teacher. Uh, a, a scientist. When I grow up, I want to have a little girl. Policia. I'm going to be the president, that's for sure, and probably some, a surgeon, probably a brain surgeon. And I want to be a... Uh, 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 what you call it? That say jokes and everything. What you call that guy that he works to say in a, in, in a displays? That I'd be on stage and people be eating and I'd be saying jokes. A comedian. I'd be a comedian. I'm a good comedian. Yeah. I said four things. I'm going to be working hard. This is a film about growing up in America. In 1991, we set off to film a group of children with diverse backgrounds and living in various places across the country. We asked them about the world, their dreams, and their hopes for the future. Every seven years, we return to see where they are in their lives. Now they are 21. What has become of them? Are they thriving? Are some failing? How have the conditions that surround them affected who they are? And how have they changed in making the leap from childhood through adolescence into adulthood? So many different factors are up in the air. What you want to do, where you want to live, relationships. There's this one phrase that I hear over and over and over again. This is the time in your life like this better do it now because you're not going to get a chance to do it again and that's almost like paralyzing i feel this sense of like panic like what if i find myself settled in three years and there are all these things that i didn't do that i wanted to do everything is wide open and and i'm living in my family's house in Westchester. Here. Oh, film me. Film me. Film me. Film me once. When we first began filming over 14 years ago, the former Soviet Union was beginning to come apart. The first Gulf War was underway. And the creator of the World Wide Web was announcing his invention to the public. In New York City, three young girls, Lucy, Kate, and Alexis, all age seven, were enjoying a birthday party on Manhattan's Upper East Side. This summer, I went to Vienna. I usually go to the Caribbean. I usually go to Santa Fe. And I usually go to hot places, deserts. Why do you want to be rich when you grow older? I want to be rich because then I never run out of money. And I also want to be rich because that's one of the things in my life that I always like to be. I like to be rich. I just, yeah, I have I a want... feeling. I think there is an enormous emphasis on the accumulation of material wealth. Anyone my age looks like dressed to the nines, wearing designer bags and, and pearls and do I look like one of them? You could say I do. I don't feel like one of them. Alexis, rich doesn't just mean that you have a lot of money. Did you know that? Rich also means very fortunate. Lucy, Kate, and Alexis attended Nightingale, a prestigious all-girls private school. I remember seeing Seven Up when I was eight for the first time, thinking, oh. That's who Lucy, Alexis, and I are lined up against all the other kids. And I was kind of mortified and, and ashamed. Like there was something fundamentally creepy about living on the 17th floor of an apartment building and, and just being so far away from, like just all the concrete. By age 14, Kate had left the city and moved to the suburbs to live with her mother when her parents separated. When I went to school, like Nightingale, most of the parents, they're so driven, they care so much. The kids care that they get into these great schools. Does that really matter in your life? Are you going to look back and think, oh, well, I, my life would have been so much more enriched if 
I'd want to Yale or Harvard. Is that really the purpose to, to you know, succeed and be the top? Does it, is that really what's important? I think my generation in particular was brought up being told that we could do whatever we wanted to do, but not in a way that was necessarily good. Like you were sort of led to believe that you were what you do rather than who you are. At 14, Alexis was still living on the Upper East Side and had been accepted to Chapin, one of New York's most competitive girls' schools. Chapin puts immense pressure on you. I mean, even like friends competed with friends. Like, oh, what did you get on that test? And then you'll be like, oh, I got, you know, uh, you know B plus or whatever. And they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I got an A and ha, ha, ha. There's just so much academic competitiveness to be the best. You know, it's semi-easy to get straight A's in high school. I'm a little bit harder at Chapin, but I was able to do it. It's very hard to get straight A's in college, and I pretty much did that. It sounds like you are just doing work all the time. I, I can never do that. Work and swim. I mean, that's my life. I started competitively swimming by seventh grade, made JV by eighth grade. In high school, I was number one backstroker. When people would be going to bed after spending nights partying at 5.30 in the morning, I'm going and waking up at the pool, you know. I put a lot of other things on hold, like college social life. A few miles in a world away from the Upper East Side, we met Lewis living with his family in a homeless shelter on Manhattan's Lower East Side. I only got two uncles, one titi, my mother, my father, and, and six kids living. So that's how many, that's how many there is. Eleven people living, eleven people living with me. By the time Lewis was seven, his father had left the family. His mother had developed a drug addiction, and he had already taken on some of the responsibility for caring for his younger brothers and sisters. As Lewis got older, his mother could no longer care for her children, so Lewis was left to live with his father. Everything was all cool until we had problems. My father, like, got a little crazy sometimes. You know, he drank. You know, so um, we went to a foster care, and we stayed there. The only good thing about it was I got more understanding of things, how things work, you know? Who, who's, who's there for you, who's not for, there for you, you know? Lewis was eventually able to reunite with his mother in Milwaukee when she completed a rehabilitation program. My mom, she really taught me to stay strong. She got us back, she won us back, and now we're living with her, so everything turned out good. Milwaukee's just got full of bad memories. Things got a little rough after you guys did the 14 up. My mom fought hard for us and got us back, you know. But it wasn't but a, not even a year later that things went back down the drain. She'd be gone two, three days at a time. We didn't know where she was, you know. And I had stayed home a lot to take care of my brothers and sisters because she wasn't around, you know. And if she did come home, she wasn't functioning, you know. She wasn't in the right... Uh, she didn't have the ability to take care of the kids. So I would have to stay home either way it went. Now at 21, Lewis has returned to New York City to break from his family back in Milwaukee and get a fresh start. So once I was 18, literally a week after my birthday, I was uh, in basic training for the Army. Then from then on, I was on my own. It's, it's going to be good. I know that it was hard before, it got better. It's hard now, it's gonna get better. So I'm just looking for, for it to, for the better part, you know? Now that I'm on my own, I, I feel like I've kind of neglected them. But in a way, if I'm down there with a horrible job, you know, trying to take care of those kids, it's not gonna work out in the long run. 
I figured I'd get out of here, you know, get out of the whole situation, doing favors for everyone, take care of me. Everybody attention? Once I'm stable, job, home, career, then I can go ahead and start taking care of each of them. Fall out. I come out here about uh, one week at a month. Currently, I am a machinery technician. So most of the things I do here on, on base is uh, general maintenance. From spackling, to drywalling, to putting in air conditioners and refrigeration, and we even do dishwashers sometimes. Okay, bro, I'll put that in like this. This is you want enough so you see how I leave a little bit behind? Yeah, mark it up top and then you're gonna mark it twice. Right? In the middle? The camaraderie in the Coast Guard, from my experience in the last months or so, um, it's great. I mean, they really, really look out for their own here. I get it. Everyone's out to take care of each other. And we all have the same mission, you know? We work together, we get it done, and that's what matters. If you had one wish that could come true, what would that wish be? To everybody to have a good life in the world and um, to give money to the poor, even if it's not Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that's all. What would your wish be? That I could do anything I want. What? Whenever I want it. I never run out of wishes for doing what? whatever I want. What kind of wish is that? When we first met Eric at age seven, he was attending the lab school at the University of Chicago and living in the suburbs west of the city. I'm going to be the president, that's for sure, and probably some surgeon, probably a brain surgeon. Mm -hmm. Eric's business ambitions started at an early age. By his 14th birthday, Eric was CEO of an internet company. His business had offices in Chicago and Hong Kong and employed 10 workers. Just as somebody who might be a good, you know, golfer, a good football player, whatever. I guess I'm a good CEO. Uh, I've got a planning meeting in the morning about this grant proposal and then investor meetings. So depending on what the news looks like tonight, it's going to depend. Now at 21, Eric is raising $10 million in venture capital for a biotech company he started with researchers from the University of Texas Cancer Center. Ultimately, what we're going to be able to do is screen and diagnose cancer without uh, the current invasive procedures that are required. Business has been an interest of mine. Uh, so has medicine. I think the last time we talked, I was still interested in medicine, and that sort of kept through all these years. How are you doing today? I'm fine. My name's Eric Nicolaitis. I'm one of the medical students here. My medical career officially began uh, when I was granted admission to med school right out of high school. Are you on medication right now for blood pressure? I finished my three years in undergrad at Northwestern and then I got a major in economics. Do you get good grades? Straight A's. Do you have a 4.0? Yeah. So I love being in medicine and being in business. When I was younger I always thought it had to be a fight between the two, you know, one or the other. What am I going to choose? What track am I going to be on? Uh, and I've somehow managed to straddle the fence pretty securely, and I love it. Take care. And how about you, Brandon? Do you know what you want to be when you grow up? Well, not really, because I do have lots of years until that is. Brandon lived in Chicago and attended the same school as Eric. I think that... Um, my life has changed. Um, well, it hasn't changed too much. Well, my dad started a new company. That's pretty much the biggest thing that's really changed in my life. What day is it today? Saturday! What day is it today?
I came here physically at 280 pounds. Never had a girlfriend and just had like really low self esteem. And I just kind of, something clicked one day early on the freshman year and I just decided to do something about it. I played racquetball, basketball, roller hockey, rugby. And I just did something every day for about an hour. I lost 70 pounds in about a year and a half. I guess my body changed, and with that, obviously came kind of this emotional change about how I perceive my body. And my parents always make sure that um, I don't ride my bike too far or I talk to strangers, and they've taught me all the things I need to know. And they, um, but I don't, I don't feel too, too overprotected though. My parents are wonderful, they're incredible parents, but they're very involved, and they were kind of very involved in my life. A lot of the reason why I struggled with doing things for myself was because of attention deficit disorder. I was very forgetful and I couldn't organize my life. Like, my, my mom very much organized my life in high school. I hadn't really done anything for myself. Brandon moved west to attend Pomona College in Southern California. He turned his childhood disorder into his college focus, majoring in neuroscience with a concentration on ADHD. I felt like I needed to be away from my parents, um, certainly not within a, a, a day's car drive, if you will, to kind of grow in a way I feel like I needed to grow, essentially to become more independent. I think I get um, the brown color on my skin from the slaves. Because my great great grandfather and grandmother was a slave. Mm -hmm. My four grand, my gr my four parents. I thought that was my pretty four, stupid. Great, great. Making black people slaves and stuff. What's the, there's white only people whipped slaves? I know. I I heard all about that. He also participates in a mentoring program at the college. Oh, wow. Every African-American freshman has a mentor that they're assigned through the Office of uh, Black Student Affairs. And uh, I participated in the program the last three years. Coco's from Nigeria. Uh, he's a really good kid. I met him last year. He was a freshman. And he was my Office of Black Student Affairs mentee. We just kind of hit it off really well. And so it just kind of worked out that we lived together. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> This is the poem that we're doing at the Martin Luther King Assembly in January for his birthday. I'm the young man, full of strength and hope, tangled in the ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the man, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. What seems to be almost assumed and crucial to what people stereotype as the African-American experience is a kind of lower income or lower middle class experience as well, as though it's part of the black experience to kind of be in a financial struggle. And so that was kind of always hard for me to be around because I didn't have that kind of experience and that struggle. And I think racism kind of manifests itself in these microcosms. It's kind of everyday little assumptions that people might make. And nothing kind of on this grand scale. Even though I have been called a nigger to my face before in St. Louis. <laughs> that was uh, interesting. <laughs> um, but I'm always very conscious of what the people around me are thinking of me and how they may perceive me in a certain social setting. and he got picked. He ran for student council, he got picked. I ran for student council and I got picked. Yeah, everybody. And everybody follows us. It's like, Everywhere. because they always want to play with us. Pick or treat. Thank you. 
Mike, Vicky, and Doug all grew up in a close-knit working-class neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. The south side is just completely different than any other city. It's very casual, very homey type feeling. Yeah, I mean, we lived within a mile of Everybody. almost all of our friends. You know, mm -hmm. we all went to the same grammar school, the three of us, obviously. The South Side Chicago did something right because there's a lot of strong families in the South Side Chicago. And I think that has a great deal to do with how we turned out. I was watching a TV show and then there was a living, the people playing Nintendo to, to get money. So I wanted to be there when I grew up. My, like, my dream is to like, because I really like playing guitar, I like to play guitar in a band. Oh, we're at Threshold of Pain. People who play alternative, they couldn't play what the metal guys were playing, but the metal guys could play like what the alternative guys are playing like in their sleep. I mean, it's like a lot more talent is required. Mike worked his way from the blue collar neighborhood he grew up in to one of America's top universities. I went to the University of Chicago. Definitely not your traditional college experience. There was very little crazy frat partying and uh, stuff of that nature. It was mostly competitions to see who was in the library more that night. It's uh, really kind of sad, I guess. I studied English literature and uh, cinema and, and media studies. What do you hope to do with that? Go to school more, I guess. I don't know. Uh, they're not the most... Uh... No, no one's lining up to give me job offers with those two majors. Dude, this job sucks. Mike is putting the finishing touches on his student film, a movie entitled Die, Zombies, Die. So let's get ready to send those undead bastards back to the grave. I think my dream is very simple and totally tangible. I want to make films that I want to make. If I can't get, make a living off that, that's fine. Um, I'll do it in my spare time for as long as I can, for as long as I have time to do that. What influenced me the most was my early, early childhood. You know, when I was maybe seven or eight, I would often hang out with the kid that lived next door to me. And our imaginations were insane, right? We would play with action figures and create these elaborate stories that went along with the games we were playing. I mean, if I like just like looked at some box, I'd be like, yeah, it's a box. But when I was seven, it was like, like oh, it could be like a spaceship. spaceship. Yeah, that's, that was a big thing. The box was like a spaceship or something like that. If I can go into something like education, or any kind of arts education, I have a fair amount of experience in that. I really enjoy it. But it's kind of strange because I know that's what, that's what I want to do for a long time. It's almost like I don't want to do it now. I want to go and, you know, play around and do all kinds of other stuff before I permanently entrench myself in the teaching position. Let's go over the mass that we're going to have a celebrating All Saints Day. We're going to start out with Douglas, and Douglas is going to be uh, giving a petition. Douglas, do you know your petition? Yes. Can you read it, say it for us? That we may follow, that we may follow Jesus throughout our lives the same Peter did. We pray to the Lord. All right, and then everybody will say. Lord. I want to be a marine something after that. A marine something, and I study about okay. all kind of. Fish. Oh, and fish. Stuff. And um, what, what my eye doctor's son, he discovered a new kind of shrimp. Doug lives in the house he grew up in and works at a nearby pet store. I do everything here. Uh, concentrate on dog sales, you know, taking care of any of the animals, uh, cleaning out the cages in the morning, all that type of stuff. Over here is where we keep the smaller animals, parakeets, over here, hamsters. It's an albino king snake. Snakes are incredibly strong. Rose hairs are pretty, pretty mellow little spiders. When I was, when I was younger, I was mostly into fish. I wanted to be a marine biologist uh, when I was younger, and I did a lot of studying about that. And uh, animals have just always been one thing that has really interested me. Doug works a second job at a local cemetery, landscaping and maintaining the grounds. This hat right here is my, is my cemetery-issued winter hat. Uh, 
none of the other guys wear them because they're kind of goofy looking. But so they end up giving them to me. I think I have like three or four of them. Sometimes, you know, just hardworking people are overlooked nowadays. That's the way it is. You know, I, I don't strive to be anything other than what I am. You know, you, you work, you do your best at what you do and go from there. You know, you wouldn't think you wouldn't think working at a cemetery, you'd think it's probably a little creepy, but it's actually very peaceful. I love it here. It's awesome to be outside. You know, you get the fresh air. It's very quiet, very nice here. There's tons of wildlife here. We have deer, there's coyotes, there's a couple different kinds of hawks. Uh, turkey vultures, there's, a, there's two lakes, we've got turtles and fish and a little bit of everything. If I don't want to be a veterinarian when I grow up, because I might change it to an actress, but I mostly want to be a veterinarian. That's what I mostly want to be. I think I want to be a physical therapist because, because I'm into sports a lot right now, so I think it would be fun to, like a sports therapist, to be around people who are, work with sports. We went through my closets and then we drank some wine. Typical, you know, what we do when we don't want to go to the bars. Yeah. I met this guy, my second day at Quincy and we started dating and I felt like I fell in love and he said he fell in love and it was just it's the first time I've ever said those words. Things were great for about a year and then all of a sudden he would say things like you're not hanging out with your friends tonight you're gonna hang out with me and if I would drink it would turn into a huge fight we wouldn't talk for days just constant fighting constant fighting yeah it was an excellent life lesson I learned what I want and what I don't want in relationships, and I think that that whole relationship has made me so incredibly strong. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I know when I was seven, I said, I want to be happy, I want to have kids, you know, I want to be married, and that's the same thing I want now. And I'm happy with myself, and I'm happy when I was seven, I was happy when I was 14, and I'm happy now. I'm just happy with the person I became. Touchdown! No touchdown! Yes. Read the read the part below it. It says the court, however, reversed and remanded. Vicky is in her first year of law school at Northern Illinois University. I was at one of our orientation things, and people going around, "Well, why are you in law school? Why are you in law school?" It gets to me, and I'm just dead serious. To meet a lawyer, why else would I be in law school? Come on now. Well, to get married, to have kids, and and um, have a good life. I want the married kids, nice house. I want the I want the fairy tale. I grew up at my grandparents with my older brother and two of our cousins, and always having family around, and it was just the greatest growing up experience. My grandparents came from Poland, brought over their two kids, had four more while they were in America, put them all through school, and then support everybody by running a bar. My grandpa was a big influence on school for me. You know, it's only grade school, but I graduated second in my class, and I walked in and told him, and he quieted down the bar, and my granddaughter's so smart, and, you know, it's something that I remember. And even when he was dying, um, we got to say goodbye to him, and he, when I went to say goodbye to him, he just whispered in my ear, I'm so proud of you. And your market has been floating up ever since. To look at where the grandkids are now, I mean, there's two that are lawyers, I'm in law school, all of the older cousins have graduated from college. I still have my one grandma, 
And any time we would play in this area for softball, she would be at my games. You know, this old lady, you know, freezing in the cold would be at my games. And it's just amazing. And I just, I don't ever want to let anyone down. Just a few miles away from Mike, Vicky, and Doug, we met Kanisha and Leroy at another elementary school on the south side of Chicago. Kanisha, what are the three ways we get our needs? Buying them, making them, and growing them. Growing them, all right. We're going to review again our wants and needs in social studies. All right, Kanisha, complete the first sentence. Needs are things what? That we must have to live. All right, class, complete the sentence. Wants are things. We would like to have what we can live without them. Kanisha and Leroy grew up in the infamous Robert Taylor Homes. Stretching for nearly two miles along the expressway on the south side, the public housing project became notorious for its gangs, drugs, violence, and poverty. Yeah, they be uh, sitting on that building. Then sometimes they shoot out that wild thing. Boy, ow. They ain't. Then they said, boo. His eye was laying on the floor. I saw it downstairs when I was going to school. I feel safe if they are shooting. I don't think about it unless they point the gun. Then I run in the house. I pray that I wake up in the morning that I be safe. And I pray for uh, him watching me and my sisters as we go back and forth to school. You have to believe in God because he's the only one that, that can count. you can count on for anything. In an attempt to get away from life in the projects, Kanisha's family moved to a small apartment building nearby. I didn't even go to the high school in my neighborhood because I wanted to go out. I wanted to be in a different neighborhood, meet different kids. I wasn't running from my area. I just wanted to live a different life that those that I grew up with couldn't do or didn't do. God is good. God is great. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. At 21, Kanisha moved even further away from the projects. She now lives with her extended family, including her mom, stepfather, two of her sisters, nieces and nephew. I started at 7 at the Robert Taylor Homes. Then I made another move, which was safe. It was better. I wasn't really living on top of a bunch of people. But then now I made a third move, which was even a better move. So we went through a lot as far as living from low income to affordable with Section 8 to basically our own mortgage. By age seven, Leroy had been living at the Robert Taylor Homes for five years. He was largely confined to his apartment in the seventh floor balcony where he played. How come you have to ride your bike up here on the porch? So nobody won't take it from me. But what happens if you ride your bike down below in the park? They're going to push me off of it and take it. There's more members in the game, huh? You might get caught up in the crossfire or something. What you want to do? Smoking on that sticky line. We go to the lake front, catch us a quick breeze. I was young. I used to like rap. But I ain't never used to do, do my own rap. And I started getting into my own stuff. Yeah. I'm yeah. finna go and kick something like sure this. Do it. I got this how I was raised, putting bloody bodies up in the grave. Don't ask me why I do it, the situation is stupid, I'm overlooted. Packing hundred fifties and dubs, none of you scrubs, can't get none of this voucher love. Cocking guys putting niggas in shock as I enter they block, dressed in all black, best to believe. Leroy was eventually noticed by a local music label, who agreed to produce his first album. Coming up in the projects is 
It's hard, you know. It's a struggle every day. Right when things was really about to, you know, progress real good, that's when I came here. And uh, I don't know, I came here for a reason. Maybe it stopped me from getting killed on the street or something, you know. I think about that sometimes, too. And claim I shot this guy. The police was just doing a um, regular routine sweep, you know. They just picked and choose somebody. I was sentenced to 12 years for attempt first degree murder. We get um, an hour for yard every day. You walk the child, um, lunch, dinner, and breakfast come right back in, lock in, and um, school time. Them the only times I'm out. The rest of the time I'm in the cell, so if I ain't looking at something on TV or something, I'm, I'm writing, you know, keeping myself occupied. DJ Lee most steady throwing parties and it don't be over till three in the morning. Nigga been starting to crawl and fall and drink. When I get out, I'm on studio business all day long, and I'm going to push my CDs even if I got to push him out of the trunk of a car, hit malls up and do my shows, book my shows, and that's it. And stay from up under the radar. That's all, you know. What's the hardest thing about not speaking English? Julio arrived in the United States when he was two years old. His mother made the arduous journey carrying Julio across the border from Central America. My family keeps on telling me do well in school, so then you'll be successful and have a good job. And have a steady job, not a hard job. <laughs> I've been here for about two years now, about a year and a half. I'm a teacher assistant. The kids are like, who's this guy just walking around? And he, he's not the teacher, but then they start seeing that he's here to help. They start calling me, Mr. Rivera, can you come and help me? So it's like, it's great just seeing, I think, when they raise their hand and really, like, I mean, want to be helped. And also, I think the first generation, so it's like first generation kids going to school. So it's a great program. Do you have any idea what colleges you might apply to? Stanford and Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> Let's jump into Colossians uh, chapter 1. And uh, who are we talking about here in this passage? Any guesses? Jesus. Okay, Jesus, yes. And, and what part of the body is Jesus? Okay. My friend in high school, he was always inviting me to come out to service with him. Like several times, this guy was really persistent. He got them asking me, and then just because he was so persistent in asking me, I, I told him, yeah, yeah, you know what, I'll go. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And it was a point where the Bible really showed me, I think, I think what the word of, of God is, you know, and, and how to really, I think, live by it. <laughs> Julio lives in an apartment off campus with four other members of his congregation. I think about it, it's like our spiritual family, you know, we try to uh, just spend time with each other, whether playing TV, playing video games, like reading the Bible. How's your day going? Pretty good. It's good. My parents came. Oh, wow. Which is like three weeks in a row. It's a surprise. No, that's Jeez. good. That's good, yeah. I invited my parents. Like, they don't want to come out. And they're concerned. I mean, like, you know what? Make sure that wherever you go, that, like, that they're not, like, brainwashing you. They're not doing anything to, like, to really, like, like get to you. I love them and I respect them. And I, I think that, like, Nothing has changed, but I just want my dad on my seat. It's like, wow, Julio's 
I mean, he's different. Like, not that he's different in a in a weird way, but it's a positive thing. I think it's always encouraging coming to service, seeing, especially being with the fellowship. It's always, I mean, it encouraged my heart and it kind of like God calls me to just a different, I think, standard. Like, kind of like to be holy and set apart, not put like school first or uh, or my or my family. I mean, I think I I I love my mom and dad, but it's gonna take time for them. Ashton grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. I stand before you at the sacred Demolay altar. At 14, he was inducted to the Demolay, a young fraternal order of the Masons. Not far away rests the banner of a beloved country. I just the meet symbol. together every once in a while and do stuff for the community. Our Eastern state's identity is to the Western people say. When she found Gold Rock Island. You think it's important to do things for your community? Yeah, that's kind of what Lincoln is pretty well known for. We help each other out a lot. Growing up in a conservative family in a conservative part of the country, I was kind of just surrounded by that kind of mentality. But now that I've kind of separated myself and been able to make decisions based on what I feel is right rather than what people are telling me to think. Ashton left the boundaries of his hometown to attend Truman State University in Missouri. I was on scholarship for the swim team my senior year. It's a great program. The people I've met are definitely going to be lifelong friends. You got to go to that? I started swimming when I was probably five or six. Been doing it ever since. I completed my four years of eligibility in college, so now I'm just swimming recreationally. It's, it's a great way to stay in shape. I feel that I'm a very amiable person. As far as I know, there's not a a lot of people who dislike me. Have you started tapering yet? Oh, no. Not close. I'm originally kind of a shy person when I first meet people, but I'll very quickly I'll come around and I'll usually become really good friends with just about anyone. I'd like to get into editing and publishing. I love books books are a great way to see how other people view the world. We chase her and, we, and I said whoever um, catches her gets to try to kiss her. Did you catch her? Yeah, lots of times. But Why? I still haven't done it. Two summers ago, I took her out and I did it at the restaurant. I proposed to her at the restaurant. Although I did ask him what he had in his pocket before we got in the car to go down. Yeah. Here. So I knew it was coming. Twillum and I have been together for four years now. She's strong-willed and she'll definitely make her opinion known. And I, I love that about her. We'll probably start a family in three, four years. He'd like it Maybe to be longer. four. <laughs> I think if I had complete freedom, I think it would be wonderful to travel and to be able to write and about everything that I'd be able to see. I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to heading out on my own with Sue Ellen to, to start, our, start our life together. I would definitely like to travel. I've been to 
a few places around the world, like Australia and, and England, and but I, I mean, there's so many other places that I'd still like to visit. I would like to go to Italy, but I don't know if we'll go there. <laughs> that would be nice. I would definitely go to Italy. I want to see the world, Alaska, South Pole, North Pole, Africa, China, Tokyo. Most of my relatives are Japanese and I want to talk to them like the way they talk. We met Michael at age seven, living blocks away from the beaches of Santa Monica. I, without question, need to go to both Ireland and Japan. I don't mean just like go to Japan and be like, dude, I'm Japanese too, believe it or not. Let's do lunch sometime. It's like I want to try to find people that are in my family tree. And I know that they're there. My dad's parents were both born in the States. They're both American citizens by birthright. Their parents were both Japanese nationals. My grandparents were interned and uh, spent, you know, over a year there. They lost everything. And it's funny, my grandparents never harbored any, Ill any aggression or ill will to the American government. They subsequently raised my dad and aunt and uncle really American. We don't speak a lick of Japanese, but that is without question had a profound effect on my Japanese. Uh, identity because I don't have a Japanese identity, you know, except for my name and whatever looks are discernible. Michael's childhood desire to travel took him clear across the country to the East Coast. Having recently graduated from New York University, he works as a DJ in an East Village club. I, I like to speak to myself pretty much. You know, I have friends and people I like to hang out with, but in the daytime it's kind of a different story. I like to be, I don't know, on my own in Paris. Now that is a town to be on your own in the daytime. It's called, it's, it's called Flaneur. Fla, it's like Flan, Flaneur. Balzac came up with that. That means to like, that means to kind of roam, be a traveler of both time and space. I suppose I could be doing a lot more than I'm doing now. These past couple months have been rather dismal since, since school has been done and I think that, I don't know, I still, I still talk to my ex-girlfriend and overall kind of how I feel right now is I kind of, I got my heart broken, man. It's going all right. I think I've got the flu. You did? No one in particular. Yeah? Nothing from anything special. Oh, how's that going? <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, right. No, it's not going. Really? What yeah, happened? I blew it. What happened? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not that smooth. I think that the real gist of it is, is that she did not need me in the kind of intangible love sense as much as I needed her. I remember trying to deny that love has nothing to do with a power struggle between two parties. But, I mean, the sad truth of the matter is sometimes, and most of the time, one of the people loves the other person or, or cares or needs the other person more than the other one does. Oh, like, some the guys are like, yeah, man, yeah, you know, like, and then the girls are like, and then the girls to the girl are like, you know, like, and then the guys to the girl are like, damn, man, that girl, you know, that girl's had sex, you know? And that's, that's about how it is. I don't know, it wasn't, like, it wasn't like going out or anything like that, you know? Do any of you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend? No. Uh, I used to. <laughs> I used to. Uh-huh. Have you ever kissed a girl, Douglas? Yes. <laughs>
once. Have you ever? She kissed me twice. <laughs> Did you like it? Mm, at the time, yes. <laughs> we're standing there and we're handcuffed together. So we, we go to Mike's house and we're like trying to saw through the metal. We like break it off with a sledgehammer finally and my hand's all aching. Yeah, we're going on now. When I was very young, I always told myself I'll be married by the time I'm 23. As soon as I met Claire, I mean, it was, it was within a week of meeting her that I knew that she was the one for me. We're fixing up everything, trying to turn the place into a home, moving all the animals and other things out for Claire to move in. It's my fiance. I had two snakes, I had two tanks of lizards, I had probably like 12 or so frogs, all kinds of animals pretty much everywhere. Got a closet right here. It, it, uh, now this was probably piled waist high with clothes at one point. This is the bedroom here. We've done a lot of work in here. Kitchen walls have been repainted. The bathroom is really a big work. We refinished the bathtub ourselves. Uh, in the kitchen, you could see that we're starting to do uh, wallpapering the wall with labels. It's uh, kind of a neat idea that my mom did when we were kids, so I thought it would be kind of cool to do it again. Over here is the fish tank, one of the few remaining animals left in the house. And uh, that's pretty much it for the house. I'm trying to get it uh, turned into more of a home than a zoo or a bachelor pad of mine. It's, it's coming along good now. Yeah. Listen, I was excited in the heat of battle, and this means nothing, and it will never, ever, ever happen again. Okay. Girls are gross. No, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I didn't want to say that. I like girls. What can I say? I, <laughs> I like talking to girls and going out with girls. I like girls in general. <laughs> I have trouble holding down relationships, let's just say. I've never been really, like, close to someone emotionally. I kind of want something more serious than, you know, just fooling around. Because it gets old, I guess. Have you been reading my diary? Get out of my room! How old do you think you'll be when you first start going out with girls? I'm not sure. Um, it's also kind of a matter if my mom will let me. There was a phase where I found myself trying to pursue these very gorgeous women that I felt like I had a chance with now. And I felt like because I looked different, I should carry myself differently as well. Oh, one, so two, three. Oh. I didn't hang out with the cool kids in high school, and I just felt as though maybe college would be my my way to kind of hang out in this group of attractive people that I didn't get to hang out with. Last year in particular, went through what my, my father would call, uh, I smelled myself. And I think there was a phase in which I kind of gained a lot of confidence and then gained a little too much confidence. Everybody happy! Today's the last day! I turned into a little bit of a jerk. But it was, I think it was, it didn't last very long, so that was fortunate. Have you had a girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Do you have a girlfriend now? Uh, I'm in the process of getting one. It's just... I knew that question was coming, too. But, uh... You know, I think it's... I'm working on it. I'll have one. It's not a problem. Yes. <laughs> At the end of the day, you'll realize that we're all alone in this world. As, as much as everyone is around us, we're all alone. And uh, everyone is going through their own life. It just happens to be that our lives cross. And, and those that can weave each other's lives together, I think, are probably the most fulfilled. Can you have babies and not be married? Yes. Well, you can't have them, but you can adopt them. Mm. I think you can have them when you're... Because, I mean, it doesn't matter. You, you, you don't have to get married to have a baby because it's something that everybody has to do or you can have an operation well, not you, to have it. Well, you have, to, you have to be with a boy to have a baby. No, no you, you don't. don't. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Imani, quit being bossy. No, toys. This is my daughter, Imani. She's three years old. She's my only child thus far. Dad! I had Imani, I was 19. Her father, we went to high school together. We had a little encounter, and then I had found out I was pregnant with Imani. Uh, I don't know if it was just to blow me off, but to tell me he never did like me and things of that nature, and I still was in love with him, that kind of hurts, you know. And I grew out of it. You know, it's been two years and a half, and I grew out of it. It's like, whatever. Now we're just friends. We get along well for Imani's sake. Say mama. Mama. Say, say dada. Dada. I'm not a big fan of living with a lot of people. Like, I can have my own place, and I'll be over here all the time, but it's just knowing that I'm able to leave and go be by myself when I want. <laughs> and I have Imani now, so she'll be looking up to me, so I have to build a better foundation for her to have a different upbringing, a different atmosphere. The things you do rubs off on other people. And it's like, if a person that has never believed that they can do anything, they'll look at you and be like, oh, I grew up with her. If she can do it, I can do it. I plan January 22nd to relocate to Louisville, Texas, which is 30 minutes from Dallas. My dream in Texas is to just go down there and go to school, finish with masters in education and counseling. And I want to do better for me and my daughter, Imani. Basically to give her something that I didn't have. I'm not going to say buy everything that I never could get, but just shop to the point of want, wanting and needs, not just what I need. I'm going to miss my family, you know, but to me it's not a big, it's not a big thing. Just change. I know a lot of people in this town, like, it's all about work. And that's where, like, they get their peace of mind. But for me, it's always been about, like, traveling, my time with friends and, and family and what I do outside of that box. And it is a box. I work in a cubicle, you know? I think I want to try and go into advertising when I'm in my 20s, 30s or so. And then all the meanwhile, like, in my free time, be writing, try and get things published, like just as a hobby, but try and get things published. And then when I retire, I'm definitely going to live out in like some rural place and just like be on my own and write like all day, all night. I just be writing. Lucy did get a job in publishing. She works as an assistant publicist at HarperCollins in Midtown. I'm in a phase where I think constantly about moving out west and like being, you know, mountains, fresh air. Yeah. I'm like an outdoors person. I like to go hiking on weekends. I'm not like a big city girl. How is it going now? It's good. Um, still with my parents. He's I'm telling you, I just think you guys would be surprised from looking at me now who I could actually be if you put, put me in a totally different place. I'm, I'm incredibly adaptable and I could live on a farm and I could... Just stock and whole foods. Like, I think a lot of people our age have the organic farm fantasy. Well, I, my friends were all like hippies. I mean, they were just all totally <laughs> this stuff. So and I I'm sure I was. I think it's kind of a fantasy, Lucy. I don't really. No, I don't think it's really going to happen. Okay. It's all, it's like a regression to a primitive time when you actually lived off the land. I feel like there are people that do this in Colorado. <laughs> there are people that do this in California, and they've been doing it since like 1966. Okay, so, there you go. Live off the land. Are you kidding me? Look at you. You're wearing pearls, diamonds, and a houndstooth coat. And you think you could live off the land? 
I hate you for making that comment <laughs> right now. Like, I really hate you. Is it, isn't it the weirdest thing that three native New Yorkers, none of us want to be here? Where would you like to live? I don't know. I'm lucky. I remember thinking when my parents got divorced and we moved out of Manhattan and I switched to a public school that I liked the fact that my life on the outside was now more normal or typical. But after I graduated, I made the mistake of moving right back into the city and I moved a block away from where I grew up. So for a little while, I had an apartment, I had a job, a real job with a salary. Um, and then I just, I just decided to quit my job and get in my car and drive across the country. Growing up in New York, I never really identified with being an American. I'm fascinated by different things that are just so basic and American, like pickup trucks and guns and churches everywhere. I might be a teacher before I get married or I might be, I might own a store. Well, I know what I want to do. I want to write. And I sort of realized when I was in New York this summer that I could stay in New York and just try to get a job that had, you know, something to do with writing or publishing, that I think I would benefit more from actually going out and doing things and seeing things worth writing about than just getting a little publishing job in New York. My original plan was to drive to California and live with a friend in Santa Cruz. I spent the drive over listening to the radio and this whole Katrina story was unfolding. I wanted to come down here, but I didn't know if I would be getting in the way if there was something I could actually do. Ten minutes after getting out of my car, I met a woman who works at the United Way who told me about the command center. And I wandered in the next morning. I've learned a lot in three weeks. Basic stuff that you just don't learn in college, like how things sort of work. I learned a lot about government policy, and I don't, I don't want to sound cynical, but I also feel like uh, I learned a lot about how, how things don't work, too. I mean, you sort of have this idea when you're a kid or when you're not really in the real world that there's kind of an overall system or that someone's in charge and, and things somehow work. And then this whole problem is sort of exposed the way things don't always work. There are definitely moments where I sort of felt like, who, where are the grown-ups? Who's in charge here? As part of the Katrina disaster relief, Lewis is stationed in New Orleans to aid in the Coast Guard's search and rescue missions. As Coast Guard's main job is Homeland Security now, taking care of the people here in the United States. So as soon as something like this happens, I want to be a part of it. A lot of guys lost their homes who were active duty, so we set up housing for them. Uh, we also set up housing for the temporary active duty guys like myself. So we got a bunch of RVs going out through here. This place is packed. It's humbling because you start thinking about your life and all the struggles you're going through, and then you go down and you see that these people got their entire lives just washed out into the ocean. And it brings you back to realize, like, you know, maybe I don't have it so bad. What's up, Rand? What's up? Are you leaving this week? Are you leaving? No matter what the situation was growing up, my mom always told me that I was able to conquer anything. I was, you know, that I would be something great. You know, even with our, our rough relationship and her not being there most of the time, she always told me I was going to do something. And um, the reason why I wanted to take care of my mother 
because she was taking care of us. And in the long run, we're all separate. No one lives with her. You know, the two boys and the girl live with my auntie. My sister lives on her own. My brother Jose doesn't even have a home. He just stays in friends' houses. My brother Bobby stays at his girl's house. My brother Jeremiah is in a foster care. We're all separate, you know. <laughs> my plan is to get everybody down to New York, and then that's where we're going to start our new future, the new generation, you know. When I get punished, I'll be thinking about, like, saying that I wish I can't wait to grow big and, you know, have my wife and my own kids and everything. And I'll be, I'll be just, I'm going to be just like um one of these people on TV. No, in real life, I'm going to be just like them. We're going to move. If I move, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna have me, I'm gonna have me a, um, one of those, those house, a house, and then I'm gonna have me a playground in a backyard, so I don't got to go hardly nowhere to, um, go to the playground. It was once the largest housing project in the world. Forty years after its conception, the Robert Taylor homes are coming down. This once celebrated housing project has failed. There was a lot of memories here. There were good memories, then there were bad memories. But it's kind of happy because there will be a change and it'll be different atmosphere. Hopefully the whole neighborhood itself will become a better place. That's the slums for you, you know. And it's, the slums going to be the slums, you know. The hood going to be the hood. And people in the hood going to do what people in the hood do. So nothing was never no surprise to me. You know. And it's been really hard on me because since we've been here, um, I lost my Uncle Ronald in the county. Then um, I lost my auntie, my mother's sister. Then I lost my father's sister. Then I lost my father. You know what I'm saying? All that. Them three was back to back, you know, within three months, you know what I'm saying? And, man, I was, I was sitting, I was just in the cell, I ain't just laid back, just frustrated, you know what I'm saying? That was real hard on me there, you know? What's gonna happen is what's gonna happen. You come to this world, you gonna die, you might live, you don't know when, you might just go to sleep and don't even wake up the next morning. You never know. Lewis plans a family reunion for the holidays to be with his mother, brothers, and sisters. He bought a car for a few hundred dollars 
and made the 15-hour road trip with his girlfriend Maggie to his former hometown. You know, it, actually, it was giving us trouble before. I know on the way up here, whenever we got caught in traffic, it would like just jerk. We knew it was the tranny. He said crap. This is Maggie. We've been together for what, three years now? Are you kidding? Five and a half. Five and a half. And a month. And, <laughs> and six days. <laughs> And how many hours? <laughs> no, I can tell you the hours. Seven hours or so, right? Because it was five in the morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my mom's always been good at throwing little get togethers, baking a cake or you know whatnot. So I figured I called her and she was ready to, you know, get a get together for the whole family, brothers, sisters. <laughs> junior, this is Junior. This is my one of my my cousins, he's a hooper. He's the one we play basketball with on the ice. But then, uh, now look at him. Damn, those eyebrows can't get any thinner. I, I messed Did you up. paint those eyes? No. Oh! 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 I messed up. I'm sorry. Hey, look. They're supposed to look like this. They're supposed to be like that. You see that? <laughs> While gathering with his brothers, sisters, and friends, Lewis receives a call from his mother. You know, when I got here, she called and said something about the electricity not working, and she didn't, you know, wasn't a good idea to come, and she wanted to go later, and and then I called her back later on, and she uh, she said, just forget it, just don't come. My mom, she really taught me to stay strong. I love her. I, I can't live without her. I to, I've told her plenty of times, I'm staying with you till I die. You know, if I move, she's going to move. If I'm living in a condo, she's in the next door condo. If I'm living in the garbage can, she's in the next door garbage can. I'm not going to make the, the effort, you know. If, if she really wanted to come see me, you know, she'd find a way. You know, most moms do that for their kids. But, you know, she obviously is not as, uh, I, I guess she doesn't really care too much. That's what the way it feels anyways, you know. It's like we're just tight. I mean, I never did want to be away from her when we went to foster care. You know, we, I grew up with her. You know, she's always been selfish. You know, it's always been her first. I think she kind of regrets having kids at a young age. I know if it was my kids, especially coming from another state 900 miles away, every second of the day that I can get to see, I'd see them. Oh, I don't know what happened. I'm like, oh, what did you bring home? Some food? Did I bring some food home? To be honest, I'm kind of numb to it. Now I got I got my mom here, you know Maggie's mom. That's that's my mom for the holiday. She's she's been there the last five and a half years. Like, been there, been there. You know anything I needed. What do you want me to make? You were coming home for dinner. When I met Maggie, I met a lot more, you know, better people in this world. <laughs> it's it's good having that extended family. I, I basically live here by myself. My parents bought the house uh, just as after we finished filming 14, and uh, they really haven't lived here uh, since, really. They were here for, I guess, a year, and then they moved to London, and then um, a couple years later they moved to Australia, and they've been there for a while. When I'm in Chicago, this is where I live, myself and the construction workers. <laughs> And I don't have a brother or sister besides my dog. So I'm mom. Sometimes when I had when I used to not have any friends or he didn't want to play with me, my only friend didn't. I just said I wish I had a brother.
Over the years, Eric's family moved to places all around the world, including Australia, London, and Hong Kong. I feel more mature, probably because I've had these extraneous experiences that a lot of people haven't had, which I can understand completely. But um, yeah, I would probably, I, I tend to associate with older kids now because I feel I fit in with them better. I don't know what it's like to live in the same house for 20 years and grow up with everyone around you. It's, it's I guess, an experience I didn't have in the same way some others did. At the same time, though, I'm not sure what I got in place of that was any less valuable or less desirable. There are nights in hotel rooms that it gets pretty lonely. When you're on the road for a long period of time and, you know, your friends are doing whatever they're doing back home and you may be surrounded by work colleagues all day, but then when you go home you're, or go to the hotel, you're completely on your own. There, there are people all around me that, that I at least think love me and, um, uh, well, that I know love me. And um, uh, so I don't feel abandoned or anything like that. It's not a matter of angst, it's just a realization that ultimately we control our own destiny as best as we can and while others look out for us, it's really up to us. We make the decisions. Good morning, Shannon. How are you? Good morning, Alexis. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready for pumpkin picking? Ready for pumpkin picking, Elena? Good morning, Lizzie. I really want to become a marine biologist. I can't see myself in an office when I get older. I can only see myself on a boat in the middle of the ocean, like working in a shark tank for some strange reason. Like, I love sharks. I was always focused. Pretty much come high school, everything I did over the summer was focused somewhere on marine biology. But through grade school, high school, I wasn't, I wasn't a very happy child. I think I took on adult roles a whole lot faster than I should have. You know, if you're well kept and, you know, really good in school or sports, you obviously have your life in order. Nothing could be possibly wrong with her because look at her life and look at everything she's done and everything she's accomplished. But in my mind, everything that I have accomplished wasn't good enough. Years of growing up in a competitive environment take their toll on Alexis. The pressures to succeed give way to a series of disappointments. She doesn't make the cut for the university swim team, and her three-year relationship with her boyfriend comes to an end. I could have been in a room with all my friends and they're all chatting away and I'd feel completely alone because a lot of times I just, nobody could relate to how I felt nor did I want to talk to them about it. You know, most people don't want to hear your crap. You're not that important that people really, people really don't care what the heck you're going through. They're more concerned about their stuff. So, you know, I wasn't meant to go divulge all my secrets and everything, you know, just from all that and then realizing that you're a senior in college. <laughs> you know, I just crashed. I had enough. My life was completely unmanageable and I just had, I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm maturing as an adult. Yeah, okay, you know, I'm paying my bills and doing all the adult stuff, but the emotional side is what I, you know, I've, you know, working on. Hello. Hello. May I have um, a cup of coffee with a packet of recolas, please? It's so funny, this being involved in this documentary, I mean, I'm not going to lie, you start to question all different types of perspectives. I mean, that's, I think, at the root of this documentary, that's what it's about. 
when you start to think about all the other kids, and that's the thing, is that you think about kids on your own level, because we're all the same age. And you start to think about, well, naturally, I'm where I am based on my socioeconomic background and just my development that in many ways was predetermined for me. Just based on what my parents were up to. I'd like to think that that doesn't define who I am or how I've gotten here. <laughs> The bottom line is, is that I'm in a position right now where I can like get by without having to uh, clean toilets or work at a McDonald's or take some sort of low-level medial job. I mean, school was the best time there was. I mean, I'm, you know, really starting to develop on your own and be away from mom and pop. And of course now, it's like, although I'm 3,000 miles away from my mom and dad, the financial umbilical cord has not yet been completely severed. You know, if I need some dough, I can call him, you know, Pop. It's Michael, I'm sorry, I need some dough. Uh, and I think that you haven't really completely developed. I mean, that's, I mean, voila, that's what an individual is, is when you're on, when you're completely self-sufficient. And uh, that's why I've got a little bit more time. Well, I can call myself a real individual. I don't think I'll ever call myself an adult, but a man. That's not right. But it'll have to do. I think the idea of my childhood being over is really, really, really sad. And I feel like I haven't yet arrived in like the benefits of being an adult, like just sort of a general sense of security and stability, if that really exists. I think the older I get, the less I try to design or forecast my future because it just Life just doesn't really work like that. But I, at the same time, there's definitely a part of me that just assumes that things just will happen. Like, I will be a writer, and I will eventually get married and have kids, and I like, will just be a grown-up. <laughs> I'm just the kind of person who's like never happy. I don't really know how to explain it. It's just that I'm not, I'm not really content. I think like the hugest fear is talking about all of these passions and things I want to pursue, going back to school and wanting to travel and wanting to get out of New York and then like not following through and doing them. I know my mother, for instance, was very much like me at my age. She kind of flew by the seat of her pants and was really seeking adventure. Then went to New York thinking, you know, I'm just going to find the ticket out and I'm going to go. And what happened was she really stayed for the rest of her life. And in a sense, like, you know, lives a lot like her own mother. It's one thing to just, like, talk about all this stuff. And it's another thing to, like, go and really follow those dreams that I have now. Sophomore year of college, something kind of clicked, and I had the realization that I can play rugby and I can, you know, organize a roller hockey team, but I just had to do more. And I think that's really where the challenge is. I think anybody can kind of do the things that make them happy pretty easily. Well, it's really like the poor and the the people who die, and like the people in the army who die and. Well, that's really not important to me, but it should be. Last year, I was grappling with how I wanted to spend my summer. And what every neuroscience major does is they do a little bit of research the summer before their senior year. 
So I was applying to a lot of different programs to be kind of a research assistant. And my father mentioned he was looking for an intern to kind of pursue this project of his that he based on a nonprofit that my grandfather started. And it's just something that was made incredibly important to me and my brother to kind of go back um, into the community you were raised and, and, and do something um, positive. So I turned down my research offers and I went home and kind of just spent all summer building this company called Love Springs. The goal of the company was to kind of serve as just a mass employer for African Americans on the South Side. That was kind of my grandfather's dream. And this is just kind of one step for him. But it was just the first time I was at age in which I could really um, be involved more significantly. <laughs> I wanted to get away from my parents to kind of discover who I am. But I didn't really discover how close we were until I got to college. They kind of keep me grounded. And I just realized that I'm a much more kind of complex and quirky, overweight nerd than I always was, just in a different frame. I think it's really interesting to talk to people this age because they're sort of like on the cusp of being a child and an adult. That's the thing I always feel whenever I go into job interviews. And it's like these very professional people are asking me questions and like if I get hired, technically I'm the same as them, right? But like the whole time during the interview, I'm like, man, you're grown-ups and I'm a kid. Like, who are we trying to fool here? They're like, where do you see yourself in five years? I'm like, Five years? I'm thinking like, like not dead or in prison. <laughs> like beyond that, I have no idea. <laughs> I see myself as kind of a realistic person. Right now, getting, you know, myself set up in, in a house where, you know, I can live comfortably with my wife, you know, uh, those are my main priorities right now. Hey, you were in the lead up until... Uh... I know I'm young and I know, you know, what everybody says, you know, I think you're too young, but I mean, I know that this is what I want, whether it happens now or in five or ten years from now. Oh, we have the little four pack like we got last time. Yeah. We both have this very similar idea of what we want you know this is what i want my life to be you know when i go to work for eight hours and i come home and see claire there's nothing more that i feel like i could really want out of life and i, and I don't see you know how could i be happier than that You want to remain that little innocent child, but then you're like, no, you can't because, you know, you have to grow up and you have to be your own person, but it's kind of annoying. Having just applied to several graduate schools for marine biology, Alexis is rejected by her first choice. A year and a half ago, I would have be crying, breaking down. I mean, it would be doomsday that every other school is going to send me back a rejection letter and... You know, instead it's, um, obviously I'm not supposed to be there. It's hard looking at myself and trying to see why I do certain things and definitely not 
I'm never going to be done with that process now. I'm never going to get my emotional diploma or something like that. No, I'm never going to graduate from that. But, you know, it's, it's a learning process. In some ways, I want to be the next female Jacques Cousteau. And I don't know how I'll do it. And I don't know in what form it will come. But if I find some research that I'm passionate about, I, knowing the way I am, I know that I, I'll be doing as best as I can for it and make whatever, do whatever I can accomplish. And so, you know, maybe seven years from now, <laughs> I'll have gotten there. Have you ever been to any other cities besides Chicago? No. Right about now in Chicago, I can say it's about 60 and it's raining. Uh, here, as you can see, this lovely. Imani likes it here. I have fun at my classes at school. So, you know, everything's coming in place for me. Okay, group A. This is a tough group. We're team A. Actually, we are the melting pot. As far as differences or uniqueness, Abe is studying network and communications management and is 20 years old. Next, we have Kenesha McDowell. She moved to Texas from Chicago, Illinois with her three-year-old daughter and her aunt. She's returning to school for her daughter. Kenesha said, I'll do research. Abraham said, I'll do research. Daryl said, I'll do reviewing. And that left me to be the team leader. So that's how we came up with the team leader. This is the kitchen area and my Aunt Ethel's room. And this is me and Imani's room. And actually, I have access to the patio from here. Here's the patio. We have a nice view. This is the view of the complex. So everything's cool. My dream is to get my own house built off the ground. Every seven years that I see you, there's been a change from living and schools and life in Imani, of course. So every seven years, I have something new and different, and it's always a positive change. I just have to keep my faith and, you know, believe that I can do it. Everybody needs love, you know, to let them know somebody care for them, you know. Some people, people commit suicide because they think family members don't care for them and stuff, you know. So as long as uh, my family loves me, I'm okay with that. My people care for me and they waiting on me, you know. Yeah, that's a big motivating force, yeah. It ain't too much you can, you know, do in here that you can do out there, but you got to make the best of what it is, you know. I don't really too much try to think about what's going on out there until I get there, you know, so I can stay sane while I'm in here, you know. Things always get greater later, but, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, you know. Part of life.
Having recently returned to New York, Lewis revisits the Lower East Side neighborhood where he grew up. I went to school across the street from an armory. I remember watching like soldiers come in and out. They had tanks and they had all kinds of, they had cadets there. And also the first time I, I, I decided that I wanted to be in the military. Would this be it? This is, this is all fitting in perfectly. I, rem I remember running from, not running, but I was gonna get in a fight with some really big kid. He said, meet me outside after school. So I just left and went straight home, right around the block. It feels good coming back and seeing where you went to school and where you lived. I didn't expect to kind of feel good about it, but this is it. Which do you like better, living here or in New York? New York. Why? It's, uh, uh, it's my kind of place, you know. I thought Milwaukee was better, but uh, I thought wrong, you know. I remember it being tough. I, I remember it being, being lonely, really, because a lot of different guys in and out of my mom's life and our life. The only guy that my brothers and sisters could look up to that they knew would never leave would be me, so I guess I had to step up to the plate. It definitely hurts when she's not around. But then again, like as I mature and, and, and grow older and experience more in life, I realized that she had it rough. She had, uh, you know, a hard upbringing, a hard child. You know, she was, she had a rough growing up. Mom, I want to show them pictures. I want to see the pictures I made. You know, when you guys came to visit in Wisconsin, when she said she didn't want us to come over there, at first I thought, okay, she's selfish. But uh, I talked to her later on, and uh, it was just that she, uh, she was ashamed. The house was disgusting. You know, she, she gained some weight. She didn't want to embarrass me. So, I guess, you know, she was trying to do something right. This is it, I'm telling you. This is the door. Here's the downstairs I was telling you about. Community room. This is it. Wow. This is, this is my building. It has to be. It's the right side. You know, I kind of wish that uh, Milwaukee was close to New York, kind of like Chicago is, you know, hour and a half, right down the block. Because it, it, it gets tough when you don't have your family to, to kind of hang out with. The first million dollars I ever make, every cent of it's going to my brothers and sisters. A nice home. You know, maybe some new clothes and stuff. They're not used to that kind of stuff. They're used to hand-me-downs and, and, you know, beat-up neighborhoods. And I don't want that for them. So if I can get this thing going as soon as possible, you know, I can have them here living with me by the time they're, you know, 14 and 12, get them in a good school, you know, show them how to grow up and be a real man. In some way, all the kids have struggled to get where they are at 21. Now on the threshold of independence, how will they cope with the increasing pressures of adulthood? What does the future hold for these 21-year-olds? As they journey forward, will they find what they're looking for in the years to come? I was high on We will be back in seven years to see where they are in their lives.